Go for it. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, comrades. And good morning, Revolution. Uh, this is This Week at CPUSA. Um, uh, if you're watching on Facebook, you should see a little button that says uh, start a watch party or invite friends to watch. You could click on that. Um, that'll send out an invite to your friends to um, enjoy the program as well. So what's on the agenda this morning, Joe? Well, good morning, first of all. Uh, again, I like your outdoorsy background, very, mm -hmm. very summery. Uh, and uh, I'm jealous because you're on vacation and I am yep. not, you know. <laughs> Communist Party is exploiting me, not giving me a break. Yeah, the man. exploitation of the working class by the working class. It's yeah, a yeah. thing. Um, and uh, it reminds me of a, no, I'm not going to tell that joke. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I will. It reminds me of a joke that I heard in the Soviet Union back in the day. And that was, uh, they, um, uh, they pretend to pay us, we pretend to work. You remember that kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Okay. Anyway, uh, we're going to have a different, better socialism. We're going to learn from those mistakes that were made in Socialism 2.0. And um, we are, you know, I wrote an article. I think we talked about it a few months ago. Oh, I forgot to take off my hat. Sorry about that. We wrote an article called The Socialist Moment in which we argued that, you know, there were a number of conflicting ideological trends taking place in the country. Um, there's a st extreme right, there's the resistance movement, which is broadly democratic, but there's also a growing left and socialist consciousness, you know, and um, we're celebrating that. We think it's a great thing. We need to uh, build on it. In fact, one of the things that we're going to be doing to build on it is holding public Marxist schools and study groups in the coming period. And there's going yep. to be one here in New York. So we're going to be announcing it soon on cpusa.org and on our Facebook page. And um, part of it will be streamed and, and uh, will be people will be able to participate uh, both in person and online. And we invite you to do so. But before we talk about the socialist moment, I think that a more urgent thing is we are in the midst of an anti-racist moment. You know, Trump went after uh, the squad, uh, they're called, uh, the four uh, women of color, progressive women, members of Congress. Congress went, went after them in the most vicious, brutal way. Yes. Um, yes. Um, they should go back to what the crime infested, you know, whatever places that they came from. And uh, I mean, three of them were born in the United States. Exactly. New York, uh, Boston. And, and it's clear that Detroit. You know, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a, a reiteration of the shithole countries thing from, right. from earlier. Um, just a, a, a nasty, ugly, racist thing. And the response from, I think, from the American people broadly has been one of, of kind of shock and, and horror at it. It seems like even within the Republican uh, Party and even among, you know, people who who voted for Trump, like seeing it that brazenly and openly is is shocking. Yeah, we have to, you know, celebrate every anti-racist uh, uh, moment and, and uh, action, um, even if the motivations are mixed and I would imagine that's for some of the Republicans it's mixed they don't want their brand mm -hmm. tarnished anymore than it's already tarnished with the election uh, uh, coming up uh, but I think that uh, uh, even that kind of self-interest uh, we recognize it for, for what it is but it is a stand against the vitriol and the at that rally you know they were shouting send her back send her back send her back yeah. you know um, and that was and that was specifically um, directed at, at Elon Omar, representative uh, from Minnesota. Yes, yes, the, um, a a a Muslim uh, woman of color. Just really, yeah, it was it was a horrifying thing to see. You know, in the in the 1980s, I believe it was the the chairman of the party, Gus Hall, uh, put forth the idea that um, the American people, the American working class, in its majority was opposed to 
racism, was opposed to war, was opposed to, was in favor of equality and democracy and peace. Um, uh, is that a, what, what was, what was the purpose of that? Uh, where did that, that thesis come from? What was its? Well, I think it came from uh, the, the uh, perception of a shift in public opinion on a whole number of uh, uh, issues, you know, and um, that, that uh, there was a growing um, a rejection of the uh, overt, you know, race baiting and, and, uh, and racism as people understood it. And, you know, that was a mixed bag in and of itself, you know, uh, and uh, mixed in the sense that, you know, for us, racism is more than uh, prejudiced ideas in a bigot's head. It's a system of practices um, embedded in the political uh, and social and economic fabric of the uh, country. But for most people, uh, it's just an expression of I'm better than someone else, you know. And mm -hmm. um, uh, but for us, it, it, it has a specific history in the African slave trade and the subjugations of the indigenous peoples uh, uh, in the Americas and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and it's built into U.S. capitalism. Very much so. But that deeper, sophisticated understanding is, is still wanting in many uh, respects. But people rejected the... Uh, you know, deep George Wallace, Ku Klux Klan kind of uh, John Burr society hatred that, you know, was commonly associated uh, with, uh, with- uh, but That was also the period, well, was it, was it that um, in the 1980s as, you know, with the ascendancy of, of Reagan and that wing of the Republican party, that, that racism was forced to, people were forced to express white supremacy in a more kind of subtle and coded way, the move toward this sort of dog whistle. Uh, like, rather than being openly white supremacist, you talk about like welfare queens or, or whatever. Well, remember that actually it was welfare queens that grew out of the Nixon campaign and Lee Atwater okay. and those guys. Oh, okay. But re remember that, that this is just on the aftermath of the 60s, the civil rights revolution, Birmingham, the bombing of the uh, uh, church, the killing of those children, the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. You know what I mean? And so um, uh, uh, there, and also the Southern strategy that was developed by the, the Republican Party as an effort to uh, win Southern and Midwestern whites to the Republican Party based on the a rejection of civil rights, you know. And, yeah, and, and from what I from what I've read, the the Republican strategy around um, social issues uh, was sort of expressed racism differently. So the 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 whole, the whole school choice movement um, was it was framed as like the you know parents' liberty to you know. Um, provide a Christian education or whatever for their children, but it was actually a response to the desegregation of schools. It was an attempt to right. um, and, destroy the, the integrated public schools. And, and we remember that uh, part of the uh, campaign, uh, I guess it was under Reagan, was the uh, Willie Horton. Mm, uh, right. Campaign. That was, uh, that that was uh, in the 88 elections, right? It was with, with uh, when Bush was... Was a, was, uh, I don't remember exactly the years, but he was a, uh, a, a uh, African American guy who uh, was formerly incarcerated, who was released, I think, on a on a temporary furlough or something like that, and uh, a rape occurred, and, mm -hmm. and 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 they used that as a device to say, you see, these Democrats and liberals are. Really I, yeah, I think that was because I remember that. I think that was the 88 um, election, uh, George Bush versus versus Michael Dukakis. OK, and that was well, but here's the point, you know, ideological uh, issues are very much uh, in flux. The counter, the counter currents that are taking place, you know, all in the mix at the same time. And so there was uh, increased racism from the uh, ruling class on the one hand, but there was also a, a growing rejection of it 
at the same time on the other. And uh, we took note of that. And we also took note that there were other progressive tendencies occurring in the American public. So this anti-racist majority idea was not an isolated one, you know. At the same time, there was a peace majority developing in the country in opposition to the nuclear arms race, you know, because they were deploying medium range cruise missiles in Europe and the Soviets were uh, deploying their SS-20 missiles uh, in opposition to it. There was this growing nuclear standoff, you know, people were scared and, and so they said, no, we want, and so you had that big demonstration of over a million people in Central oh, wow. You know, it was a huge, huge thing. A solidarity take, took place. The AFL-CIO brought out 500,000 workers, you know. And, wow. Uh, this was in opposition to uh, Reagan and the destruction of the air traffic controllers union. And there were big marches for women's reproductive rights and so on and so forth. And so we, we projected at that time that there were growing uh, democratic and progressive majorities in the country. At the same which is, time, which is going to bore out, bore out in many different respects because without um, that anti-racist majority, and when we say anti-racist, we don't mean in a, in a developed. We didn't mean in a developed sense. You might even call it non-racist. They weren't yeah. fervently for racism. They weren't fervently against it. You know, they didn't have a deep understanding of it. Uh, they recognized racism as something that was contrary to democracy, to some sort of American ideal of something. Yeah, it was kind of a why can't we all get along, everybody's yeah. okay, kind of my best friend is, you know, yeah. Yeah. kind of a notion, uh, which, you know, was, uh, we would hope and we strive for it to be deeper, but it was what it was. And without that, you got to ask the question, could Barack Obama have gotten elected president in 2008 if that you know majority sentiment didn't didn't exist? Yeah. And as I say, it's in flux and it goes back and forth, but the trends are you know still there, and so we have a situation right now where you have a third of the country, at least of the voting part of the country, organized in the Republican Party. Yeah. That is clearly influenced by racism. Yeah. But then you got to ask the question: Well, where are the other two thirds? You know, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, it is there that, that that those majorities, roughly speaking, exist. And part of this has to do with what we we think of as as partisanship uh, for the working class. Like we we call ourselves partisans of the working class, which means that we we recognize that the the working class has a material interest in um, in smashing racism, in um, uh, creating equality for, for all people, uh, in event ultimately in overthrowing capitalism, and that those material interests can be uh, brought out and, and mobilized and um, so such that the, the basic point of Marxism that the, the working class uh, will liberate society from exploitation and this is this is caught up i think this notion of the anti-racist majority is caught up in that that partisanship uh for the world indeed class. indeed and and in fact you know uh you can't defeat the right wing without challenging um fighting for that material interest and challenging the the uh, racism that uh that is uh used to divert workers from it and you know i had an interview the other day with an Italian newspaper, La Repubblica. And oh, wow. the reporter asked me, she said, well, you know, so some academic had written a book in which he or she said that the reason that, you know, what the working class voted for Trump was because they were mad at the Democrats for being, basing themselves on oh, identity politics, yeah. you know, that whole, yeah, I kind of, you know, I kind of laughed, you know, because you, I said that question is just so loaded with wrong concepts, you know. First of all, the working class is not white, number mm -hmm. one, 
And number two, I mean, it's white, black, Latino, you know, Asian, it's male, female, it's gay, straight. And, and so you just can't lump it. And, mm -hmm. number, and number two, the reasons that people voted for Trump were mixed. Yeah. Some of it was based on racial resentment. That's, that's true. You know, and and part of it was uh, based on anger and a feeling of economic insecurity. All of those factors were. And part of it was based on a, a, a multi-trillion-dollar propaganda campaign conducted through the NRA and Fox News and and conservative evangelical churches and yeah, uh, that 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 are constantly pounding the, you know, the 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 white supremacists the. Um, sexist, uh, you know, the interests of the ruling class. I had uh, the opportunity and pleasure of having a dinner with uh, a friend of mine uh, last week who was involved in the theater here in, in New York. And she invited a friend uh, who was from the South, a woman from South Carolina. And she was like, look, the reason that people voted for Trump was white identity politics, plain and simple. And all this talk of that it was based on economic insecurity is a bunch of baloney. Because the fact of the matter is that, you know, oh, the job that were lost where I'm from in South Carolina happened way before Mr. Obama, you know, way before. Mm -hmm. So you can't blame him. And, and, and it's all a bunch of, uh, of uh, baloney. So. I'm only saying that to say that that might be a little, you know, one-sided, though I think that, you know, she probably knows her people. She knows who what she was talking about, but they were both, you know, economic and social, cultural, race and insecure were part of the- And those things are not separable. The um, no. you know, economic insecurity, um, I, I, I suspect it makes people more susceptible to the influence of the sort of ambient structural white supremacy of American life, and especially the the propaganda campaign of the, and then the propaganda campaign of the extreme right builds on that. Like, um, you know, you're you're getting screwed over because of, um, you know, we're we're lavishing all these benefits on poor people, which is like a code word for black people, even though the majority of welfare recipients are white, um, but. Yes, yeah, so there's always, you know, economic insecurity and, and racial, uh, racist resentment is, are not really separable, I don't think. No, and, and, and here's the point, you know, in, in, in order to uh, defeat these concepts and defeat these policies, you know, you got to address the both economic and uh, political concerns of everybody in, involved. And, and that on the one hand means directly challenging racism and sexism and putting forward programs that uh, address both. But you also have to put forward, you know, uh, economic and social programs that benefit everybody. And, um, and to the extent that you do that, you're going to be doing things that will help isolate the right wing. I was talking to a younger member of the party the other day about that. And I looked, I said, look at Obamacare, for example. There were a lot of folks who were very much opposed to it until they like, started yeah. receiving its benefits, you know, and still there, yeah, those preconditions uh, were no longer applicable to them and their children were able to stay on for several years. And they were like, oh, wait, hold on for a minute. Don't take away. Don't yeah. take away, you know, so there was a... And it, it introduced disarray in the Republican Party because it was a massive tax on the rich and they've been trying to get rid of it. Um, and every attempt they've made so far has, well, not entirely, but but largely failed. And it, it is it's shown people that they have no positive strategy for for helping the majority of Americans. They, it, it's just, you know, at this point, like a, a bone deep opposition to Obamacare and, and subservience to insurance and, and pharmaceutical companies and the rich. But my thinking is that people are waking up and that there's gonna be an increasing rejection of these kinds of uh, overtures uh, 
to uh, racial resentment, xenophobia, white supremacy, and prejudice, uh, and that there's going to be, and we're going to see that in the next election. A lot of people think Trump's going to win. I, I, I don't see it. I don't see it, at least at this stage, you know. I mean, we, I think, we, you know, the, the 2018 elections showed that the, 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 the broad democratic movement can do amazing and powerful things. Like, what happened with both the state and national level in 2018 was huge. And if we can repeat something like that in 2020, you know, it'd be a, another really significant step forward, you know, changing the composition of the, the House and the Senate, even, you know, further to the, like, retaking the Senate, um, making the House even more progressive. Um, yeah, I think it can happen. But here's another thing. This racist attack, on um, the squad, on um, uh, Omar and AOC and, and the others, is coupled with an anti-communist attack. Graham, they're all a bunch of communists. Go back to where you come from, you know? Yeah. Go back to Russia, kind of, even though Russia is yeah. a capitalist yeah. country and, and Putin's a big time capitalist these days. Um, and um, and so some you people- all back at the party a lot. Like if you love, communist so much, why don't you move to North America? So, and, you know, the response is always, no, like, the, the, the fight is here. Like, this is my country, and I'm not going to let it be ruled by, by a clique of, of, you know, racist, sexist oligarchs. Like, that's not, the fight's here, and this is where I'm staying. But here's the thing. Racism and anti-socialism and anti-communism always go hand in hand, you know? The uh, the race hater is also the labor beta, you know? Yeah. And uh, as Martin Luther King pointed out many years ago in a speech to the uh, AFL-CIO, I believe it was in 1961, it always comes hand in hand, you know? And, and so be careful, folks, you know, because when they get into the uh, red baiting, the racism is not far behind. And when they yep. get into the racism, the red baiting is not far behind. But yeah, here's the pictures of people marching with signs in the in the fifties saying race mixing is communism. Uh, exactly, exactly. Or, or um, KKK posters from the thirties saying, you know, um, communists are are about preaching equality. Like, you know, um, good Negroes shouldn't go to communist meetings because they're and that was because the Communist Party, other people on the left were in the van of the fight against racism and, and, and uh, Jim Crow. And, um, and, uh, and so we have to recognize that um, as it, you know, is reoccurring today from the lips of Lindsey Graham and, and, uh, and uh, others. And so both it's really important that both be rejected and rejected uh, strongly. But here's another side of it. People are saying that, well, you shouldn't, some are saying, um, put forward the socialist concept and fight for the elaboration of socialist ideas now because that's only going to help the right wing. I think that's nonsense. Like. I mean, so socialist, I, this, the idea of socialism has been put forth. It can't be, you know, crammed back into a box. The, the working class is in the process of figuring out. Socialism is working class power. But what does that mean? What does it look like? The, those conversations are happening now. The process of figuring out what socialism here will be is happening. Um, so if we step back from that, that just means that we're not participating in those. Like, um, and, and I think, you know, we might just be a bunch of communists, but our, our input is our input is necessary. But you did have a concern that there were certain people who were attacking um, the progressive congresswomen and other members of the, you know, political life for being radicals and left. And, and how does that concern fit into? You know, I think that there's... So there's this, this whole group of people that think of themselves as, that pride themselves on being centrist, moderates, the adults in the room, you know, what have you. Um, and they're really, 
opportunists. They, they, they swing with the, the balance of forces. So um, when, you know, the extreme right is doubling down on these racist attacks, you see uh, folks like um, uh, Pelosi and other sort of centrist Democrats take a much more aggressive stance against the left. And this is, it's not just Pelosi, it's also columnists in the Washington Post and the New York Times, people saying, oh, finally, you know, these entitled children on the squad have got what's coming to them and we need mature, responsible, whatever, bipartisan, this and that. Um, the, those people get more vicious, the stronger the right wing grows. But the stronger the left grows, the more they will swing toward the left. That's my well, thought. I would, I. I think that we have to make a distinction here now. The, the, the center is not the enemy. The main enemy is the no. extreme right. We got to stay focused on that. And then the other thing is that the center is, is, is not a homogenous, you know, uh, coalesced, uh, you know, uh, group of uh, people, that there are different, you know, trends and tendencies that are taking place. But it's, but it's nature is that it swings. Like the main political, I, I would see anyway, the main position or, or contradiction right now would be between the, the growing kind of um, left progressive uh, socialist, not quite movement, uh, and the extreme right. And there's this centrist force that was the dominant political force for a long time, but is, is now losing ground and, and trying to, you know, move whichever way it can to, to secure its own. But isn't it also true that the center has shifted, I mean, to the uh, left to a large extent? I mean, for example, if you, it's, it's it, it, at the last Democratic Party convention, the platform that was adopted was the Bernie Sanders program in many respects. Yes, but so there, there's a distinction that I failed to make. Um, the, 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 the ideological center um, has definitely shifted. Um, the American people have shifted largely to the left, a huge chunk of them. But the, um, the sort of ruling class centrist forces, the uh, the the Bloomberg's, let's say the um, trying to think of others, the Schumer's, the um, that sort of section is, I think, trying to find its bearings and and will swing, could swing right or left based on, you know. Well, I mean, you know, there 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 are a lot of different people who represent the that that you know kind of. My congressman, if I was living in Youngstown, his name is Tim Ryan, you know. Uh, he's a working class guy representing a working class district. He said he wanted to run for president because he wanted to get to, to rid the country of this socialist notion, you know. Um, <laughs> but on other issues, you know, he, he, he takes good positions. And so I, I think that our, uh, Go has to point out, you know, golly guy, why it wasn't socialism that got rid of the mills in mm -hmm. Youngstown and yeah. then uh, Lordstown. That wasn't socialism. That got that that was NAFTA. That mm -hmm. that they opened up. They shut down the uh, Blazer Chevy plant at Lordstown. They opened up one in Mac. That wasn't socialism. That did. That. We have to be able to to point that out um, to show who the real enemy is. Uh, and uh, and uh, but at the same time to 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 keep our um, fire directly the at the right and try to continue to win those who are wavering because you're right the liberals and, and others kind of move to the right un, under pressure and, and you you, you said before that's kind of a yes I'm sorry uh, I interrupted uh, no I was just going to say not to give them up to that right wing pressure. But you, you, I think you what define it as, a, as a yes and kind of thing. Like, you know, we're against the extreme right, but we go beyond the center. So anytime someone puts out an, an idea that moves toward democracy, toward equality, our response can't be, oh, you know, that's not enough. So it's, it's an enemy. It's, you know, yeah, that's right. And 
we also need this thing and we also need this other thing. So it's, it's a no to the extreme right and yes and to anyone even vaguely moving in a democratic direction. Yeah, we're for left center unity and you're not gonna be able to defeat the right without that, you know. That's, that's for damn sure. Well, I think that that does it today. Um, Friday, uh, July 19th, in the year of our Lord, 2019, uh, and, and, uh, I think we're done. <laughs> uh, today. Which Lord is that? Huh? Which Lord is that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there are many different interpretations uh, of that for, for sure. Uh, I'm not going to get into it now, uh, but in any event, have a good weekend. We have memes on our Facebook page uh, uh, saying around uh, uh, Ilhan Omar and uh, around uh, the four congresswomen who have been attacked by these racist, fascist-minded bigots. We encourage you to circulate them here on Facebook and in other venues and social media. And uh, we'll be back. <laughs> Next week with a new edition of uh, This Week at CPUSA.org. Talk to you later. Stay safe. Take care. Bye Thanks. now. Thank you. All right.